So I'm a writer, and I write stories about war. And I'm a veteran of Iraq, but mostly overseas. I saw more of war's aftermath. Early in 2007, there was a suicide truck bombing in Habania, a town outside our main gate. And uh, Marines and say, uh, soldiers, they went out to help, bringing the wounded back for medical care. I remember early in the night, I was holding a, a stretcher with an injured Iraqi child, maybe nine or 10 years old. His body was riddled with shrapnel. It was the first time I'd, I'd seen anyone, let alone a child, injured like that. And I remember thinking, I will never forget this child's face. By the end of the night, though, I couldn't have picked him out of a lineup. There were far too many, the wounded swamp, the trauma facility. Doctors ended up doing surgery on the floor. In one room, they were stitching a man's intestines back together just a couple yards away. Um, Navy medical personnel were aiding a mother and father holding their bloody but still breathing infant child. And though at the outset I'd felt horror and grief looking at these things, by the end of the night I'd settled into a kind of shocked numbness. I did the very little I could. I don't have medical expertise. And then I went about and did my job as a staff officer. And I kept busy, and that worked. Uh, you keep busy, you don't have to think too much about the things that you've seen. And I don't think I wanted to think too much about the level of violence I'd seen enacted on Iraqi civilians, especially because I knew that that bombing was just one of hundreds of suicide truck bombings that had gone on and that, for that matter, keep going on in Iraq today. But a couple weeks later, I got a letter from my great aunts, the aunties, sweetest old ladies in the world. And the letter said, there's going to be a lunar eclipse, and you should go make sure to see it because the Middle East is supposed to be the best place to view it. So I set aside time on my calendar, and when the day comes, I go out and I look at the lunar eclipse. Now, if you've seen a lunar eclipse, you know the moon darkens. My moon had turned the color of blood. I told a poet friend of mine that, and he laughed. He said, what a cliche. But it didn't feel like a cliche. It just felt like a simple fact. The moon had turned to blood, and why not? I climbed up on top of my swall hut and looked out on Habania where the bombing had been, and it felt as though something in my universe, in the, my idealistic notions of the world and how it worked, that it started to shift. And I thought about the things that I'd seen, and I thought about the things that I hadn't felt but maybe should have. And I climbed down from the swall hut, and I did what anybody would do. I called the sweetest old ladies in the world, my great aunts, the aunties. And they're so excited, right? A call from Iraq. And, um, you know, they said, did you see the eclipse? I said, yeah, I did. And they said, wasn't it beautiful? Wasn't it wonderful? And I lied. I said, yeah, it was beautiful. It was wonderful. And we talked about the eclipse and, you know, even about its color. Apparently, blood red is between a three and four on the dungeon scale of lunar luminosity. <laughs> Who knew? Um, and I walked away from the conversation Feeling a little disconnected, yeah, but also calmer, happier. I talked to people that I loved, and in my mind, I'd spared them unpleasantness by keeping silent about the things that were on my mind. I knew I was no hero, like the Marines I knew or the Navy doctors. But at the very bare minimum, I could be admirably stoic, joining the long lines of Marines and soldiers unwilling to share the burden of the terrible things that they've seen. It was a story I told myself, and a story that appealed to me and also one that conveniently allowed me to set aside the things that I'd been thinking of up on that swall hut. Joan Didion once wrote, we tell ourselves stories in order to live, which is true. And of course, we also tell ourselves stories in order to kill, stories in order to heal, stories in order to show ourselves our responsibilities to the things that we've seen, and stories to help us evade those responsibilities. Because my aunties aren't just the sweetest old ladies in the world. They're also some of the smartest, most thoughtful people that I know. They're generous spirited, the kind of people you can trust to have a real conversation with. I got back from Iraq in 2008, back to a country that didn't seem to be paying too much attention to the wars that it was sending young men and women out to fight. And it's a situation that continues. I remember talking to a journalist who'd embedded in Iraq, and he said, you know, just the other day, oh, sorry, embedded in Afghanistan, he said, just the other day, I caught myself talking about the war as if it was over, and I was just there. So what does that say about the rest of us? That disconnect enraged me. The American people, after all, are the boss. It's our responsibility to hold our elected leaders accountable. What hope 
do Marines and soldiers and sailors have of having good military policy if the boss isn't paying attention? At the same time, though, there was that conversation with the antis, the story I hadn't told them, and in fact, all the stories from that year in Iraq that I hadn't told, that I'd been afraid to tell. I wanted civilians to feel about the war the way that I did, but I didn't want to have the responsibility of telling them why they should. And it occurred to me that perhaps the stories that I was afraid to tell were exactly the ones that I should be telling. The conversation on Iraq is just beginning. And thankfully, we have a lot of smart people dedicated to making sure it's a thoughtful and a brave one. There's Brandon Willits, a Navy veteran who started Words After War, a writing workshop that brings both civilians and veterans together to write about conflict. There's Arts in the Armed Forces, which seeks to heal the civilian or bridge the civilian military divide through theater. And we have an increasing number of veterans in the arts and in journalism using their experiences to enrich our understanding of war. We've come a long way since the days of we will be greeted as liberators and rapidly transition over to the Iraqis. But there are a lot more stories that we need to tell if we're going to be more responsible about how we use military force. And that, I suppose, is why I'm a writer. Thank you. <laughs>